the difference between different types of links, the different implications that uh, using one link versus the other would have in your, your analysis results. So hopefully by, by the end of this webinar, you'll have a little bit more information uh, about links and it will help you have a more you know, informed decision as to what link uh, to use. Before uh, I jump uh, into the content of the presentation, just wanted to give you a little bit of background about, about myself. Um, so I did my bachelor's degree uh, in civil engineering at the University of Puerto Rico. Then I moved to Connecticut to do my master's and, and PhD at the University of Connecticut. And for the past five years, I have been working at CM2 Associates as a structural engineer. I consider myself uh, lucky uh, in the sense that I have, you know, I have been able to work in a wide variety of projects at GM2, both from the design aspect as well as from the, the low rating side. A few of the, the key projects I have worked on, uh, for example, this one here is a superstructure replacement we did in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, a very fast-paced design-build project. It was done in, in six stages, and each stage was uh, about a week. So very fast-paced, very challenging and interesting project. Um, I was also involved in the, the, in the design of the full uh, structure replacement of I, uh, this bridge over I-91 in Connecticut. Uh, we ended up using a DRS IBS apartments, uh, which is a, a type of abutment developed by FHWA, and it, it ended up working, working very well for, for this structure. Uh, from the load rating side, uh, I have been involved in numerous load ratings over the past few years. Uh, I think I, at this point, I probably lost count of them. Um, the, the most prominent, I, I, I would say, it's the, the low rating of the Gold Star Bridge in Connecticut. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, the Gold Star is uh, one of the iconic bridges in Connecticut, actually considered uh, the biggest bridge in the state. So again, very, very lucky to have been able to, to put my hands uh, on, on this bridge. As far as, far as uh, the presentation, I'll start with a brief introduction of, of links, why we need them, and what, where are they used. Then I'll proceed to discuss the different types of links. Uh, I'll touch a little bit on elastic links uh, versus rigid links, what's the difference between, between those two. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the different types of elastic links and the different applications for, for those types. Um, then the, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about model validation, uh, which is might be one of the most important parts of the, of the presentation. Uh, I'll, I'll present a few validation examples and a few uh, workarounds for, for the most typical issues that, that we normally see. And then I'll finalize with some modeling considerations and tips uh, for when you are uh, modeling links in, in MIDAS. I want to start with, with the presenting the concept of insertion point uh, because it, it's something that's going to become more and more relevant as we as we go through the through the presentation. So when you, when you have a beam element on, on an APA model, basically obviously you're going to have that element is connecting two nodes, right? Um, so those nodes represent a, a point with the, the cross section. Um, by default, in Midas, that, uh, that reference point or that insertion point, it's at the CT of the section. Uh, so for those of you who have done a, a lot of models in Midas, you'll probably notice that most of the times we have to, we end up having to move that insertion point somewhere else uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the cross section. So in that case, that's, that's what we call an, an offset insertion point and again it, it's something that it's used in most uh, in most models uh, in bridges uh, so keep, keep that in mind as we go through the presentation because i'm gonna be referring to the insertion point uh, in a few different occasions so here we have a, a typical steel steel girder superstructure and if we look at it the way it will look on a, on a Midas model 
essentially we're going to have uh, beam elements for for the main girders and you're also going to have the elements uh, and nodes for the cross frame members now this cross frame member elements are at a different elevation from the from the girder nodes uh, from the girder elements so at this point the software doesn't know that they are connected right uh, in reality uh, basically we have a connection plate and we have a web that it's uh, connecting the, the cross train to the girder uh, at this point the software just, uh, just doesn't know that so that's why we have to tell the software that these are connected these are physically connected and that's uh, what we need uh, links for uh, for example here it's a, a cross section of that same bridge. Again, here at the top, we have the insertion point of this plate girder, and then we have the cross frame members. So, even though if, if you turn on the the three D rendering in Midas, it will look like these nodes are you know, touching that that plate girder. But again, at this point in, in reality, the, the software doesn't know that they are actually connected. It's not until until we bring the, the links in uh, that we tell the software that these are actually uh, connected. So th this is one of the simplest applications of links, and it only gets uh, more complex from there. For example, you could have a, a more complex structure where you have uh, stringers that are resting on floor beams connected to uh, to a truss. And the cross section of that will look something like that. So you have your deck uh, supported on your stringers that are that are in, in fact being supported by the floor beams connected to that main truss. So in the model, it could probably look something like that. Uh, this being the insertion point of the stringers, insertion point of the floor beams, and then your main truss element. And again, at this point. We have to tell the software that this, uh, all of these elements are uh, interconnected. Um, that that again is done uh, with, with links. So now that we that we have a, a good understanding of where we apply links, on, why why do we need them? Uh, we, we can jump into the types of links. Uh, essentially, there are two main types of links. You have Elastic links and you have rigid links. Uh, briefly, elastic links uh, behave similar to uh, an element in the sense that they have uh, a stiffness in the different degrees of freedom. Rigid links, on the other hand, is either either you are you have the degree of freedom released or you have it rigid, right? So the rigid links are more of a displacement constraint. Uh, whereas the elastic links, uh, you have a, a stiffness that the, that the user has to define uh, to that link. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll get a little bit deeper into the differences between the two uh, a little bit later. Um, so as far as, uh, uh, as elastic links go, uh, you have different types. You could have a rigid elastic link, compression or tension only link. You could have a general link or multilinear. I want to make the distinction that rigid elastic link it's not a, it's not to be confused with rigid link. Uh, in you know some applications, you may use one or the other and end up getting the same results depending on the application. Uh, but the the way the formulation works and the way the software looks at it, uh, it's uh, completely different. So, like like I said, uh, elastic link acts uh, similar to uh, an element. So, in that sense, uh, you can only connect two nodes with an elastic link. Uh, so, you're gonna have two nodes, and instead of having an element connecting those two nodes, uh, you're gonna have an elastic link with the stiffness that you assign to to that link, and let me right so jumping up to the 
the first type of elastic link uh, I want to discuss. Probably the, the most commonly used elastic link is the, the rigid elastic link. Um, basically, what you have here is a, a link that has infinite stiffness or is simulated to have infinite stiffness in all six degrees of freedom. Uh, so when, when you select an elastic link, uh, a rigid elastic link in Midas, it will automatically assign a very high stiffness to simulate uh, rigid behavior. And when I mention very high stiffness, it's really a very high stiffness relative to the elements that are surrounding that link. Typical uses for, for these links um, include uh, near uh, at, at the ends of uh, plate girders, where, where you link the support node to the node uh, at the bottom of the girder. And later, I'll, I'll have a, a little bit more detailed discussion on the end conditions. And then uh, we also use that uh, at diaphragm connections. So when you have a, a channel diaphragm or, or double or white flange like you use as, as a diaphragm, uh, we typically use a rigid elastic link to connect that uh, to the girder. The other type of elastic link, it's a, a compression or tension only link. So this type of link, it's only going to have axial stiffness. Uh, depending on you know, whether it's compression only or tension only, and then it's going to be active uh, only in one or, or the other. These are typically used when you have uh, special configurations or uh, soil structure interaction. Um, so for example, uh, when you have integral abutments, uh, it's very common to use uh, compression only links. Something very important to know about these types of links is that they are nonlinear in nature. And the, the reason for that is uh, it requires an iterative procedure to, to be able to solve a structure when you have these links. So to understand that, I just want to briefly mention how, how these links work and how the, the, the software looks at it. Uh, so let's say you have, for example, a structure where you have compression only links. Um, as, as an initial guess, the software is going to consider that all of those links are active. Okay. So it is going to analyze the structure, assuming that all of those links are active, and it's going to find out which of those links are in compression and which of those are in tension. Those links that are initially found to be in tension will be removed from the model autom automatically by the software. They will be removed from the model and uh, the software will, will rerun the analysis. So it's going to keep uh, doing that iterative procedure until it finds that all the links, all the remaining links uh, are in compression. So having that in mind and, and knowing the inherent linear nature of the influence lines used for mobile load analysis. Uh, this link cannot be used for mobile load analysis. So if you if you need to do a moving load or a live load analysis for a structure where you have these links, uh, essentially you're going to have to come up with different locations of the truck that you want to investigate. and have that as a, as a static load, and then run the analysis based on that uh, on that static load, or or series of uh, static load phases, to be able to, to capture the the governing effects. The other type of link is a uh, general link, general elastic link, and as as the, as the name suggests, uh, this is the general the Elastic link that gives you the, the most flexibility in, in the sense that you have to define a stiffness in all six degrees of freedom. 
Now that statement could be a known, known value or it could be a very high stiffness to simulate uh, rigid behavior uh, in some of the degrees of freedom. So for example, uh, an area where we have used this, these types of, of links is uh, this trust bridge where we have the, the stringers connected to, uh, to the floor beam. Um, on this image, basically, this stringer on the right it's, uh, has a fixed support on the floor beam, but the one on the left has an expansion support on the floor beams. So for the one with the expansion support, we define this link here as a general elastic link. And all, all degrees of freedom, except for the for the axiom degree of freedom, all of the all, all the degrees of freedom, we wanted them to be rigid. So we had a very high stiffness uh, to simulate rigid behavior. And then the the axial stiffness we set that to zero. So so we, we could get that expansion at the at the support of the of the stringer. So I mentioned that we use a very high stiffness to simulate rigid behavior. Now that's something that you need to keep in mind for general elastic length. If, if you're going to do that, uh, you have to make sure that that you calibrate that stiffness that you're using for, for the rigid behavior. Um, and there, there's a, a very straightforward process to do that. Uh, basically, you want to make sure that whatever high stiffness, stiffness that you're using, it's actually simulating that rigid behavior that you want. So the, the process to, to calibrate that stiffness is uh, you can create the, the model with all the links modeled as rigid elastic links, and then create a duplicate model. And the, the location of, of those links where you need to release one or, or more degree of freedom, change that to general, uh, general elastic links at those locations. But then use a high stiffness to in, in all the use the use of freedom, right? So essentially, what, where I'm going with this is you want to have one model with rigid elastic links and a second model with general links that have a very high stiffness that behaves exactly as your as your first model. So uh, it may take a few iterations. Uh, but you want to make sure that you you increase that stiffness in the general elastic link until you get the same results as the model with the uh, with the rigid elastic links. Uh, at that point, then once you get the same results uh, between both models, at that point, then you can say that the high stiffness that you have assumed or calibrated is actually behaving. As, as a rigid behavior or as a rigid uh, link. So after that, then you can start releasing or, or applying the, the known stiffness to the specific degrees of freedom uh, that you need to do. In, in our previous case, uh, after we did this, we got the same result from both models. Then we just release the, or we assign a, a zero stiffness to the axial uh, degree of freedom. Now, uh, moving on to rigid links. Um, as, as I mentioned before, rigid links, it's more of a geometric constraint. So what, what it does is it will, it keeps the, the distance between the nodes that are being constrained, keeps that constant throughout the analysis. And another, another main difference between rigid links and elastic links it's that with rigid links, you can uh, you can link more uh, more than two nodes. So the way it works is you have to define a, a master node, then you define one or more uh, slave nodes. And again, the distance between those two are kept constant throughout the analysis. So what happens is if your master node experiences some translation that slave node is going to experience the same translation. 
if your master node is experiencing rotation, then that slave node is going to experience translation and, and rotation. So that slave node essentially can move due to translation of the master node, due to rotation of the master node, or a combination of both. And another, another thing that's very, very important about these types of links is that the, the slave node is going to pick up all the properties of your master node, all right? So if you have a support condition on your master node, essentially that will get transferred to your, your slave node. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a couple of slides. So typical applications where we have used uh, rigid links, uh, add beam elements to, to plate elements transition. Uh, for example, here we, have, we had a bridge a, a top girder bridge where we modeled that with beam elements. And the analysis with beam elements suggested that the bottom flange was, was buckling, the capacity of the bottom flange was insufficient. And it was buckling uh, because of that negative moment that it was, it was receiving, or, or compression on the bottom flange rather, due to that negative moment. So, we wanted to investigate further uh, whether that bottom flange was, was actually buffeted. So we already already had the beam element model. So we created the top girder with uh, plate elements uh, within the region of interest, and then used rigid links at the, at the transition from beam, beam to plate elements. Um, in that case, we used the, the girder node as the master node. And then the nodes along the perimeter of the top girder and our uh, slave nodes. Uh, perhaps the, the most typical application of rigid links is uh, at, the, at the ends of the girder when you are modeling your, your support condition. So I, I wanted to show here three different configurations that, that I, I have seen. Uh, what, when, when looking at different models, uh, two of which are, are not correct. And then the last one here, it's the it's correct configuration. So the first, the first configuration that I, that I have seen is um, you have this node here is the insertion point of your plate girder. And then you have the node for the cross frame and a node at the, at the bottom of the of the girder. So some, uh, I have seen that you know that insertion point gets assigned as the as the master node and then all of these three nodes are are slave nodes. Now the, the problem with this is uh, what I mentioned before that that the slave nodes uh, are going to pick up the properties of the master node. What happens is your master node here doesn't have any, any support condition. So that means that these three slave nodes are going to pick up this property. So that means even though you have a support condition defined here, once you start running the analysis, this node will pick up essentially that. So it, this, this support condition is, a set, is going to be deleted from the model. Uh, luckily, Midas gives you a warning for that. So it's going to tell you that the constrained degrees of freedom at the slave nodes are automatically released. So you you may get this message and you know, may, may not be aware why why is that happening. Uh, it's because you have a support node as a, as a slave node. So that is essentially getting deleted when you start the analysis. And in, in and in that case, again, if all your supports are end up being removed during the analysis, then your model is just not going to run. So the good thing is that's, that's something very easy to, to pick up. Um, the second case is a similar configuration, but the, the support node gets uh, assigned as the, as the master node. Now, this one is a little bit more trickier to, to catch because 
the model it's still stable with that and it's going to run and be, unless you know it's it's not correct you won't be able to to see it right away uh, again and the, the problem with this configuration is that your slave nodes are going to pick up the properties of your master node so that means that this support condition that you have here is essentially going to be applied at each of these nodes, which is obviously not uh, not what we want. So, the the correct configuration is to have uh, an additional node below that bottom of the girder node, and that's going that's the one that's gonna be assigned as your support node. Then you can use an elastic link between these two nodes. So essentially, you are isolating that support condition from from your master node. So after know, knowing what we know about links, uh, the most important piece of advice that I can give is validation. You have to validate your model because you may have a, a link defined the correct way in the sense that the structure is stable and everything, but it still may not be behaving the way the way it's intended to do. So uh, as far as the approach for applying links, uh, I think it's very useful to, to start with a very constrained model and then start releasing the degrees of freedom gradually. Um, what, what that's going to do is, for example, you start with a very constrained model and you validate the structure behavior of that model, you run the, run the, the analysis, everything looks good. Then you start gradually releasing the, the degrees of freedom of the links that you need to release. And along the way, as you're releasing them, you run the analysis and make sure that everything is, is going the way, the way you want it to, to be. Um, that way, if you at some point you reach an instability issue, you will know exactly what, uh, what release is causing that instability as opposed to starting with the model, with a model that has all the releases you need, uh, it ends up being unstable, or, or it's, it ends up not behaving the way you want to, to behave, um, then it's a lot more difficult to figure out what is exactly uh, causing, causing the issue. Uh, typical items we, we use to validate, uh, very straightforward to look at bending moments. If you, you have a simple spanner, you got, if you have a continuous span, you know what those bending moments in that diagram should, should look like. So it's very easy to just look at that and qualitatively see whether your model is doing the right thing or not. Same thing with uh, deflection. If you have, uh, look at the deflected shape, see if it makes sense, look at the, the actual values of deflection that you're getting. If you have a, a hundred foot sample span bridge, and you look at the deflection, the deflected shape looks good, but then you look at the values and you have like 10 inches of deflection. Obviously there's just something, something wrong with that. And unless you look at those things and validate that, uh, there's just not no easy way of, of knowing where there's, whether there's something wrong uh, with the model or not. Another item, uh, or tool for validation, it's verifying the intended load path. So if you, by judgment, you know that if you apply a load at one point, it should get, you know, that should get transferred into X moment at uh, this other element. So you apply that in the model, see whether that, whether that behaves uh, that way. Um, same thing with, you know, you could do that at different locations, uh, in the model with, with different uh, member member forces and see whether whether the member forces you get in the model are actually what what you should be expecting. So the, the first validation of sample I wanted to talk about it's uh, a simply supported beam. So what what I was telling you about that you may you may have the links properly defined, but if you don't validate, you could end up with uh, incorrect results. So this, this is a perfect example that 
uh, that scenario. So here I have defined the links uh, at the support the way I explained earlier. Um, but when you look at the moment diagram, um, you're seeing some negative moments uh, at the end. So obviously this is not what, what a simple support beam uh, should look like. So, and again, unless you take your time and, and look at these, um, you, you, you're not gonna see you know, what's wrong with the model. So this, this has to do with, with the, the support or, or not being at the CG of the section. Um, uh, that will become a little, a little bit more clear uh, in, the, in the next example. But once you have this, uh, the the workaround or, or, or the fix for this, it's really adding beam and releases at the end. So once you add, you, you keep the the links at the end the same way, uh, you add beam and releases at the end, that negative moment is going to drop to zero. And then you end up with the, with the correct bending moment for a simply supported beam. Um, again, if, if this is not done, you could be seriously underestimating your, your positive moment at maintenance, or which is obviously something um, you, know, you, you don't want to be doing. Um, for the second example, here I want to bring back the, the concept of the insertion point, because uh, like I said, most, most of the time you will end up using an offset insertion point. And when you do that, what Midas does internally is that it finds a link between the CG of the section and the offset insertion point. So even though you, you didn't define a link here, Midas is implicitly assigning a link there. So essentially you're gonna end up with the same issue that, that I just explained in the validation example uh, one. So here I have three cases. The first one has the insertion point at the CG of the section. And as you can see, without any releases or anything else, you get the, the correct bending moment diagram for a simply supported beam. Uh, the, the other two examples, uh, one has the insertion point at the top, the other one has it at the bottom. So as, as soon as you have your support or your insertion point anywhere other than the CG of the section, you're gonna start seeing uh, you know, these this negative moments at the ends. So, like I said, it, this, this is a result of that, of that internal rigid link that Midas uh, does when, when you do the offset insertion point. Uh, it is the same issue as the first example. So naturally the, the solution is the same as the first example. Uh, once you have beam and releases at the ends, uh, all three cases, will end up giving you the, the same result. Um, the other validation example I want to, I want to bring is, uh, this is a, a trust bridge we were doing. And every, we, we checked the model, everything, everything seemed to be fine. Uh, when we were looking at member forces, uh, we noticed that the forces at the, uh, in particular bending moments at the, have a bottom cord, just they just didn't seem they, they didn't seem right. Uh, specifically, this here at the ends, uh, we were expecting to have you know, zero moments at the ends, so we were getting these huge moments at the ends of the, of the bottom cord. Uh, it took us a while because you know, we, we thought we had the model properly defined and everything. And after after looking at it for a while, uh, we noticed that out of all the, the members of the trust, these two diagonals had the insertion point at the top instead of the center. And because of that, that was essentially causing the, the whole structure to, to behave uh, improperly. So once we, once we noticed that, we changed that insertion point of those two di diagonals to the center. And immediately, we end up getting a much more intuitive uh, member forces. So here I am. I'm just showing 
the difference in member forces from one model versus the other one. And not only we had a huge difference in, in the shape of the moment diagrams, but if you take a look at the values of those member forces, uh, you know, for the first model, we were essentially getting seven times more positive moments than the, than the second model. And obviously at a different location as well. So again, uh, sim simple, simple things in the model, simple inputs in the model that can hugely impact the the results of your of your analysis. Uh, the other example is uh, again uh, that, that same trust bridge. We have the the stringer that the, the, the stringers that are supported on the floor rooms. So for those we use uh, rigid links. And those rigid links initially we had all the degrees of freedom constraint. And when we looked at the, the moment diagrams of, of the stringers, we noticed that there was something wrong. So these stringers are continuous over the floor ring. So we were expecting uh, you know typical positive moments between floor rooms and then seeing that negative that big negative moment at the floating locations. But when we looked at the bending diagrams, we we did see that negative moment at the at the floating locations. But immediately at the other side of that floating, we were seeing a, a positive moment. So there, there was a, a step in the moment diagram that it was just not making sense. So that immediately raised a red flag that there was something going on uh, with the with the model. And after looking at it uh, for a while, uh, we finally figured that the rotation of this master node was introducing an additional uh, moment on that on that stringer, and that was that was causing the issue. So what we did to fix it is. We kept the, the link as, as it was, but we just released the, the moment in the y axis. And just by doing that, that release, we were able to get the moment diagram that we were expecting. So you'll see your, your big negative moments at the floor room locations, and then a positive moment between the floor rooms. So again, just here, just comparing the huge difference, something as simple as one release in, in the rigid length uh, can have in the in the result of your of your model. Uh, the last example I wanted to, to bring for uh, as a validation example, it's uh, it's a kind of an unusual bridge configuration that we that we had. Um, so this is a girder floor rim system with a, with a very high skew. Uh, we have uh, the piers along these lines. Then these are our through girders. Traffic is going in this direction, northbound and southbound. And then these are our floor rooms. Uh, so the the most unusual configuration of this this bridge is that we have a diagonal joint running along one of the of the floor rooms. So this bridge, uh, when it was designed years ago, it was designed so that the left side of that joint expands this way, and the right side of that joint expands this way. So Basically, these are all fixed bearings. And then to the right side of the joints, is, it, it, they become expansion bearings. And then the opposite happens on this side. You have fixed bearings on this side and expansion bearings on that side. So the original original joint detail was uh, uh, like this. So it has the left side it's attached to, to that floor room with the fixed. And then the right side of that joint, on the, to the right side of that joint, the deck was uh, free to slide 
over over that flooring to obviously allow for the expansion of the bridge. The problem with that is that with time, not only that flooring began to to corrode because of you know, leakage through the joint, but this this side of the deck ends up hammering against the, the top plank and damaging the, the deck. So uh, we were doing the, the rehabilitation of this bridge. And as part of the rehab, uh, we wanted to come up with a tie down system that restrain, you know, prevents that deck from hitting the top plank while still allowing for for the expansion that that needs to to occur for for the bridge to work. So for that we needed to do two things. First of all, we need to know why why the deck is hitting against that flooring. What what's causing that that scenario? And after that, we have to come up with a design load for for this for this tie down system. So we looked at it. And essentially we found two configurations that, that were causing that deck to hammer against the floor rim. The first one is when you have your trucks loaded this way, essentially your each half of the bridge is, is deflected like that, causing that, that side of the bridge that is not onto the floor rim, it's causing that side to open up. So once this load is removed, Obviously, this gap closes and it hit, it hits uh, the top of that floor bin. The other more intuitive scenario where, where, where that happens is when all your trucks are loaded to one side of, of the of the joint. So the side of the joint that it's fixed, uh, or the side of the deck that is fixed, will deflect with the floor bin, and the side of the deck that is not Actually, the floor essentially stays where it is. So picture your trucks going from the left side to the right side. So you're going to have this scenario. And then immediately after that, you will unload this side. So it's going to go up. And you will load this side, which will cause it to go, to go down. So that was the other scenario where, where the deck was hammering against that, that floor room. So in the MIDAS model, we had, it, uh, we had it modeled that way. So essentially, this is the fixed side. That's the side that was uh, put to slide over the deck. And we use a series of elastic links uh, to model that and essentially use, use the force uh, on those links to, to come up with the design load for the, for the tie down system. And the last part of the presentation is the modeling considerations and tips. So how, how do you begin to, to think about what type of link you should be using in your, in your structure? Uh, first thing you need to consider is what degrees of freedom you need to constrain. Uh, if you need all degrees of freedom constrained, then you could use a rigid link, right? either rigid link or a rigid elastic link. Uh, depending on, on whether you need, you need member forces uh, or not, or depending on your application. Uh, if you know that, you know, if you know the stiffness in one or more degree of freedom, then you may, you may need to go with a general elastic link. Uh, if, you, if you have a special configuration, then you, know, you may go with a compression or tension only link. You should also consider the size of the model. Uh, for smaller models, it's it's not really that big of a deal. But as you as you model larger and larger, or as you build larger models, uh, it's going to become more important uh, because, like I mentioned, elastic links are essentially uh, elements. So that means that they will go into stiffness matrix and the the software is going to come up with member forces for those elastic links, which is not the case for, for rigid links. So that means the influence lines and the, the moving load analysis, all of that um, 
influence of the of the moving load have to be calculated for elastic length. So for large for ver larger models, uh, elastic links uh, tend to take more time to uh, to solve. The other thing you want you want to consider is whether you need member forces at, at the location of the link or not. Whether it is a special configuration like like the tie down system that, that we had, or you have a beam end where you, where where you need the reactions because you're doing beam end trading. If that's the case, then you're essentially going with a with an elastic link, which is the, the link that will give you member forces. Um, the last model in consideration is validation. Uh, no matter what you're doing, uh, whether it's you know, looking at links, beam and releases, or a simple model, um, you have to validate it because it's it's very very easy to have a model that looks right from the model's perspective, but it behaves uh, the wrong way or, or it does not give you the result for the information that you're targeting to, to obtain. Uh, the final model, model in consideration I wanted to, to bring is uh, link management. Uh, th this is not something that you know, needs to be done, but I think uh, I, I have found it very helpful and again, when dealing with, with larger models, uh, Midas has uh, boundary groups, so you can assign links to to those boundary groups. And what helps a lot is to use you name name those boundary groups or those links with something that is uh, descriptive of what what they are connecting. Well, for example. Uh, here we have you know, stringers, rigid links. I know that all the links assigned to this are rigid links and they are connecting stringers. So that, that again, it's not technically needed, but that becomes more important when you are, first of all, self-checking your model. If you have a very large model with a lot of links, you want to check each type of link at a time, you can just, using these boundary groups, you can only turn on uh, certain links to, to help you isolate that. And it will also help if somebody else is, is using the model, whether it's checking it or taking it to, you know, to further completion, uh, it's gonna make it a lot easier for them to, to check that model and to make sure that everything is, is defined properly. So with that, uh, that's the end of my presentation. I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, you guys may have. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Luis. Uh, so yeah, we do uh, have a bunch of questions. And uh, before, before that, I just want to thank you, Luis, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, just a very... Uh, it's a lot of model with very in detailed uh, uh, link applications. Uh, we're just very impressed. So uh, I can go ahead and present some of the uh, some of the question right now. Uh, just give me one second. Um, okay, so let's. To find big value defined the searching point to anything but center center. How do you find that by doing so? I'm on both. Find the insertion point what it seems to be line bracket value. Um, I short short answer is yes, I do. Um, I, I I I do see value of, of the find the searching point. You know, other than than center center, um, I know it may look like it's just like for graphical purposes, but uh, again, it's when when you have larger models, it's it really becomes uh, if you don't have things graphically correct, it really becomes very easy to to have omissions or or to miss something that 
that may be affecting the model. Um, there's there's no need to to be uh, you know, to move away from from using offset insertion point uh, as long as you take the proper precaution and, and validate your model. I I think the benefits are 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 really there. Um, let's see. Links for for bin to bearing and bearing to subtractor functions. How do you actually model? Um, how do you actually model different bearing types? Um, that's that's a very good question. A way of of um, defining, for example, elastomeric bearings. You could use. You can have a, a support node. And the, the elastic link that, that you used to connect the bottom of the girder node to that support node, you could make that, a, you, know, you could assign the, the stiffness on the, on the elastomeric pad uh, if you want, if you want to, to make it more accurate. But another way of doing that is that you can have that link from the bottom of the girder to the, to the support node. You can have that as a rigid, rigid elastic link. And then the support use uh, instead of defining the typical support, you could define that as a as a spring support. And um, again, in, in in that case, the 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 spring support you have to define the stiffness for it. So you can define the the stiffness of the elastomeric pad uh, uh, on the on the spring support. And um, bridge flow rate in the sign was in minus stable versus leak RC here. Um, I I don't have any experience with leak load rating, so I can't speak to that. Uh, about the Midas, um, I, I think my, Midas has has a very robust uh, load rating module, uh, especially for uh, for bridge press concrete. And for uh, for steel composite girders, I think it, it does a very good job of uh, doing low rating. Um, what I would recommend, though, it's again it comes back to validation. Um, when you're doing low rating, for example, in Midas, it's it, it's worthwhile checking that every, everything has been entered properly. So you could check just do spot checks of. of Touching properties, make sure that, for example, for a composite girder, it's taken the, the correct stiffness, uh, yeah, second properties at the correct stages. And um, also you could you could uh, spot check uh, capacities and and rating factors calculation, just again, just to be on the safe side and make sure that you are covering your bases uh, and you're doing your due diligence uh, when when using the software. All right. Uh, I think our uh, time is uh, it's up, unfortunately. So uh, if you do have any other questions, uh, which I do see some other questions, uh, we will uh, definitely try to answer it via email. Uh, and then again, uh, I want to uh, say that uh, this this webinar is recorded, and I will send you a follow up email uh, containing the link. Uh, with the presentation a PDF file, so you're gonna find it on our website. Uh, yeah, and then just in case you have missed it initially, uh, this webinar is provided by uh, Midas expert Luis. Uh, and like a lot of other experts, Luis is really good at uh, Midas. And uh, if you do want to uh, connect more with uh, experts like Luis, uh, you can join our Midas uh, expert network. Uh, and it's totally free uh, because we want to have a more, uh, a better interaction between users and uh, between us and users, of course. Uh, so yeah, uh, so Louis, do you have any closing notes uh, that you want to say to the audience? Um, no, other other than you know, thank thank you for uh, for joining us today, and I believe we do have a, a smaller Q and A session now, right? So if, yes. you, if you sign yeah. if you sign up for that, uh, I'll I'll be happy to answer any any additional questions uh, in that. Uh, so yeah, for other than that, I think uh, really appreciate everyone to show up. Uh, and I hope you uh, learned a thing or two today. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, we'll close it from here.
I hope everyone uh, have a good day and uh, please stay safe and stay healthy.